This presidential race has clearly tightened since Kamala Harris entered. The candidates will now face off in their first ever debate in two weeks. And while Trump had rebounded from setbacks and legal woes, his own former aides have started saying he's been off balance or needs to be energized ever since Harris upended the race. Trump has just brought back some aides from his 2016 team, including his ex-campaign manager, Corey Lewandowski. Trump's first campaign manager, Lewandowski, ran the beginning of that 2016 race and navigated a bruising primary. He was seen as an insider ally as well during the first term and a national MAGA voice on air with stints at One America News Network as well as CNN. There are Trump aides who come and go. Lewandowski's new return shows a loyal and high-ranking official back in the fold and representing the 2024 campaign. And he is my guest tonight. Thank you for being here. I appreciate the opportunity to come on. Absolutely. Uh, we have the debate to talk about, plenty to get to, but let's begin with the big news this past week. RFK Jr. endorses Trump. Uh, as a campaign official, my question for you is, does the Trump campaign see this as a meeting of two people who agree or strange bedfellows who disagree on key issues? Well, look, RFK uh, probably would have been the Democratic nominee had the system been not rigged against him. And he had an opportunity to have a voice in the process. I think he would have beat Joe Biden, to be very honest with you. But then he went out and decided to run as an independent, realized that there was no path for him to be successful there. And when it's specifically when it comes to the issues that are most important to him, he decided he looked at both of the candidates and said Donald Trump is the best candidate to lead going forward. So on Friday night of last week, we had a massive rally in Glendale, Arizona. Yep. Uh, RFK was, you know, supported at a, a, a response I'd never heard from anybody else that Donald Trump had introduced before. It was amazing. The crowd was so invigorated. And what I think it also does, RFK brings a special subset to the campaign. Those moms and women, 25 to 40 years old, who are concerned about their children and the vaccines and the food that they're being ingested by the government and the mandates that the government has put on some of those products, are coming now to the Trump campaign disproportionately because they support the belief that RFK is going to help fix that problem going forward. Okay. So you're saying the Trump campaign views him positively on that. Uh, we also got a peek into uh, their conversations before the endorsement in a July phone call. I want to play some of that. This is Trump talking to RFK. Take a listen. I agree with you, man. Something's wrong with that whole system. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I had some doctors, you find. Remember, I said I want to do small doses. Small doses. When you... When you feed a baby, Bobby, uh, a, a vaccination that is like 38 different vaccines, then you see the baby all of a sudden starting to change radically. I've seen it too many times. And then you hear that it doesn't have an impact, right? Uh, given that statement and what you just said, is, is Donald Trump endorsing RFK Jr.'s vaccine conspiracy theories? This is someone who, is, as you may know, but I'll remind everyone, RFK Jr. has said that COVID itself was uh, made to target, quote, both Caucasians and black people, uh, that he, quote, won't take sides on 9-11, uh, that the CIA, control, CIA controls the American press. Uh, whatever your press criticisms, I, I haven't heard you take that position. Um, how much of this should we understand to be the Trump campaign's position? Uh, and can you tell us what role RFK Jr. would play in health policy? We're hearing reports he could be involved in the transition team. Well, RFK Jr. has been someone who's been very steadfast in making sure that when it comes to the decisions that affect your body, you get to choose. And what we saw was government mandates, whether you're a government employee at the local level, the state level, or the federal level, being forced to take an injection in order to save your job. And RFK was against that. By the way, I think a lot of Americans were against that. Yeah, I'll jump in. We I'll let you finish. As you know, Corey, I'll always give you time. You're talking about policy, and, and you're referring to something that's, that is true. There was a wide national debate about government requirements. Uh, I would just mention, I asked you, though, about RFK's actual conspiracy theories. Are you going to tell me that you and Donald Trump think COVID itself was hatched to target people by race, or, or are you going to reject that part of his agenda? Ari, I'm not here to answer questions for RFK Jr. He's a big man. He can do that on his own. He's been on television a number of times to answer his own questions. What I am here to tell you is that he has a microphone to an audience who's very concerned that the government mandated vaccines into their children and themselves in order to keep their jobs. And there's real Americans who lost their jobs and their livelihoods because of what the government did to them. And I think when it comes to RFK, specifically those moms who have young children, 
They're very concerned about what is being injected into their children, whether it's through the food supply or through these vaccines. And RFK has an opportunity to go out and talk about the fact that he was right. The government should not have had to mandate those. We don't know the full impact of what was mandated by the government on the long-term repercussions that it could potentially cause. So we're very much in line with RFK on that position. All right. I got your answer on that. Uh, we have the headlines about you. Uh, you're not the whole focus of this interview, uh, but you were a big figure in 16. And as, as people know in politics, uh, it happens on a lot of campaigns. You were, you were replaced. Uh, you're back here. It says uh, Donald Trump's bringing you back. Some people, uh, I'll give you time to respond, view that as a sign that he thinks something was wrong, that he needs the old 16 team or he needs to shake it up. Uh, I also want to mention we have the debate coming. Uh, Trump, as you know, has complained publicly and vociferously about many debates, including this one. Uh, but it looks like it's on. Uh, so the two-part question, uh, Corey, is one, uh, are you back because the campaign needed a change, that there was some problem uh, with, the, with the campaign or the team as of last month? Uh, and second, uh, what should we expect in this debate? Is it really on? Are they still squabbling over the mics? Why is Donald Trump so worried about the mic rules? Well, first and foremost, I'm back because the president asked me to be, not because it was any concern with the leadership of this organization. They have done an amazing job. Look at what they were able to accomplish uh, in a competitive Republican primary field, the, the largest success that any candidate in modern history has ever had. And not just that, before I ever joined this campaign, they drove the Democratic nominee out of the race, something that's never been done before. And for the first time in American history, Donald Trump's going to have the opportunity to be two Democratic candidates okay. for president. And he so did. And Trump did. I'll ask you. Trump did fine in that debate, as you mentioned that history. Does he miss Biden? Sometimes it seems like he'd rather be running that race. Look, I think Kamala is an easier target, to be very honest with you. I think she's going to be easier to beat. She, she is saddled with the Biden administration's policy. She has flip-flopped on what she believes and what she doesn't believe. And as it relates to the debate, Ari, mm -hmm. you know, just remember, when the criteria for this debate was set, it was set with the Biden-Harris campaign, not just with Joe Biden. She agreed to all of the terms, specifically as it would have pertained to a vice presidential debate, which she had agreed to. And that meant you stand at the podium, there are no notes required and no notes allowed, and that we have the microphones off. She wanted to change that criteria because she went from being the vice presidential nominee to now the presidential nominee. We all agreed to what it was. Why she wanted to change it was she wanted to be the same height as Donald Trump. She wanted notes. The fact that she continues to hide from the media and the countdown clock is finally on for her of when she's going to sit down for her first national media debate should be appalling to every journalist in America that has taken her 20 plus days to sit down and do an on camera interview. Do you feel that you guys are now good uh, on an agreement and on the mics for the debate? I think everything has been settled and we look forward to this opportunity. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned Kamala Harris. She has a new ad today uh, hitting you guys on something that Donald Trump used to talk more supportively about and now has distanced himself from the Heritage Foundation related Project 2025. This is a new ad. Take a look. Detailed plans for exactly what our movement will do. It's called Project 2025, a 922-page blueprint to make Donald Trump the most powerful president ever, overhauling the Department of Justice, giving Trump the unchecked power to seek vengeance. What is your campaign's position on Project 2025, number one? And number two, if you're going to tell me what Trump has started to say, which is, that he's not involved in this thing, uh, then why do so many parts of the Republican platform overlap with 25? And we can put examples on the screen for you, including, uh, as I think you know, abortion, uh, streamlining DOJ, purging uh, nonpartisan public officials, et cetera. Look, Ari, it's very simple. President Trump has said he has nothing to do with Project 2025. I believe the project has been closed. That was a project of the Heritage Foundation. And there are a lot of groups out there on both the right and the left who come up with policy initiatives and policy ideas, but it doesn't mean that the candidate's going to implement them. Look, as we know, the Kamala Harris campaign is riddled. 60 employees from the Center for American Progress are there. They believe in taxpayer-funded reparations. They believe in transgender surgery without notification for minors. Does that mean that the Kamala Harris campaign supports everything that CAP endorses? Maybe it does, considering she's got 60 people over there and has called their leader one of the finest leaders. So if that's the case, and we're going to hold candidates accountable for what uh, outside organizations on both the right and the left are doing, then we have to hold everyone accountable. And I haven't heard ask anybody ask Kamala Harris. I know she hasn't sat for an interview, but I don't think the CAP 60 staff or people are going to be asked about tomorrow or the next day when Dana Bash is there. Because she support, if she supports their ideals, 
then she should have to answer for them. And I don't think that's what's going on here. Well, as you know, Corey, we have no idea uh, what Dana Bash will ask. But uh, on the abortion issue, which is very important, uh, we'll put it, put it up. Uh, OK, you're, you now, on behalf of the campaign, are saying you, that 25 isn't yours. But the current GOP platform um, has a, a 14th Amendment effort uh, to try to give what they sometimes call, quote unquote, fetal personhood, or basically would be synonymous with a national abortion ban. Uh, and Project 2025 uh, tries to also go after, as you know, abortion rights, even women's right to travel if they want to move in and out of their state, which people are allowed to do. I don't know if you support, as on behalf of the campaign, policies that say a man or a woman can't leave their state for a certain reason. That's a big liberty crackdown. What do you say to people who can read these two things and say, OK, uh, Trump and the platform are basically 25 on abortion? Look, I, I know nothing about Project 2025. I've never read their document. You say it's 900 plus pages. I've never read it. I can speak on behalf of the president. I'm certain he's never read a 925 page document that Project 2025 put out. But I will say this. President Trump did what the American people overwhelmingly wanted when it came to the issue of the issue of life. He returned it back to the states by appointing pro-life judges at the Supreme Court who overturned Roe v. Wade. And now every state gets to decide what their respective state looks like as it relates to the health of, of the mother, the, whether it has exceptions or not, because they're doing it the ballot box, Ari. And listen, we've seen states like Kansas take the same positions as much more liberal states. And then, and but listen, we're an amazing democracy. We're an amazing okay. melting pot. Well, and what takes Kansas place in one against, state I may not happen in a different. Kansas went against Trump, went against your campaign. Uh, Trump has been hiding on what he's going to do on the Florida state rule, uh, which is up, and he lives there. Are we going to get uh, a position from him on that? Look, if the president wants to weigh in, I'm sure he'll weigh in at the ballot box like every American gets the opportunity to do. I think we've got 16 states that have this issue at the ballot box. The voters get to decide how they're governed. That's how the system is supposed to work. That's exact. There's no there's no dictator in this system. So let the people go decide what their state I hear laws you, but look let me, like. Let me push back and I'll give you time, Corey. I hear what you're saying. Uh, but if... Donald Trump puts people on the Supreme Court who overturn 50 years of precedent. And then all these states, including, as you mentioned, more conservative states like Kansas, organize and revolt and push back on something that had been set a law. At what point do you have to admit, on behalf of Donald Trump in this campaign, um, that this is being rejected by the voters, red, blue, and purple, uh, and that this wasn't a good idea, that this was a crackdown on rights? I mean, if you say to me, this is the laboratories of democracy, but most of the democracy, including red states, says no to you. At what point do you then respect that and reflect that in how you govern if you were in a second term and how you deal with the Supreme Court? Ari, right, we, we know Donald Trump's been very clear. Uh, when he ran in 2016, he put out a list of potential conservative judges that he would appoint. The American people knew what his position was going to be on that. And he, he was very clear about that. Now that they've returned this decision to the states, I live in the state of New Hampshire, we get to vote on it, which may look very different what the state of Massachusetts does. And so listen, why wouldn't we want these individuals who are living in their respective states to have an opportunity to weigh in of what they think is best for them? And, and look, that's how the system System right. works. It's not Donald Trump's decision. So let people decide and let's go and live our lives. Yeah. All right. I got your answer on that. Uh, while I have you and we've been giving you time, uh, I do want to turn to something that came up in the last time we did an interview. And it's been a few years. You're back here on a, as a representative of the campaign. That's a way back machine, baby. Well, Corey, when you were on here, we asked you point blank about these reports that Donald Trump, as president, had tried to use you as a kind of improper cutout to shut down uh, an open federal probe, which is a big deal. Uh, we have some headlines on that, and we asked you about it at the time. And when you went in and were facing uh, the House investigation, it also came up, including our interview. Uh, let's take a listen to that. I don't ever remember the president ever asking me to get involved with Jeff Sessions or the Department of Justice in any way, okay, shape, or form, so, ever. So that wasn't true, was it, sir? I heard that. And that was not true, was it? I have no obligation to be honest with the media just because there's just as dishonest as anybody else. Perhaps I was inaccurate at that time. Can you state well, for the record? Let me, let me ask you. I'll give you the question. Amazing, I'll right. give you the question. You can get the I answer. Back then. We, we heard you on the campaign, uh, 2024. Now I want to turn to this to deal with it. First time you've been back since then. Do you want to state for the record that what you stated on air was false because people are listening to you about the campaign? And why should they believe you if you're lying about other things? Ari, if we're going down this road, are you going to say that Donald Trump had a bandage on his ear just for a spectacle? Are you going to say that that was false? The guy got shot in the head, and you said the only reason he had a bandage on his ear, I can read you the quote if you want, 
that you said it was just for spectacle. So, so you, if you want to apologize, two things. You're not, you're not Ari, answering the question, Corey. Ari, you're, I, you're not uh, answering you, the question. Do you take back your statement? I know what you're Donald referring Trump to, and at the end of the interview, we can touch ear? base on that. We're going to finish this okay, question. But, I, will, I will return to that. But the question on the table is, do you admit now for the record that when asked that point blank do you about Donald Trump, I said I'll go to it at the end, and I will. I'll do that for you. Okay. But right now, so the question is, you it? agreed to come on and be interviewed. You got I time. absolutely did. Now I'm asking you this. Do you admit that you were stating that falsely at the time because the investigation was about whether Donald Trump was trying to get you to get Sessions to shut down a lawful probe. Ari, if you tell me that you admit that you were wrong, that Donald Trump wasn't having a bandage on his ear for spectacle, then I'll take you for your word. So you tell me that you were wrong. So you're not, I, you I, I told you I'll come back to that at the end I'll, because I will, but you're okay, not going to answer the question. So Ari, listen, here's the deal, man. I'm with you to answer questions, but you can't ask me something when you're not willing to say that you were wrong too. Right? So admit I, right I told now you I'll come back to that. Wrong. I mean, again, okay, the viewers are smart. Corey, the viewers are smart. They understand that having been busted, under oath, you admitted that. You said, quote, I have no obligation to be honest with the media. And so this is relevant because even though I'm being fair and giving you time, if you admit under oath that you were not telling the truth, it is relevant now. And now you seem to be unable to address that. I'll play uh, one more exchange from your House hearing. Take a look. <laughs> so that the reason why you didn't uh, admit that the president had asked you to deliver a message to the attorney general about investigations because you knew it was wrong and you were concerned about your own exposure and you didn't have immunity in that interview. Isn't that correct? Which interview? So you can't give me any other explanation except your concern that you or the president could be criminally exposed based on what you attempted to do on his behalf. Is that correct? I didn't say that. I don't recall that particular interview. Final chance to address this, uh, the Trump administration had an open investigation. Then President Trump did ask you to interfere with Sessions, and you did lie about it in public, yes? Ari, listen, we've been down this path, okay? What well, we I haven't. Was, this is your first it, time it, back it, it, since Ari, the past. That, that interview was four plus, almost five years ago okay. to the day, to be very honest with you. Okay. You guys want to relitigate something from half a decade ago, and I think what you'd rather have is me talking about what the future looks like for the next president of the United States and the policy differences Corey, between Donald Trump and Corey, Kamala Harris. Corey, let's be Harris. straight. You're, you're, you're a clear, let, straight let's speaker. Let's be straight. I, I gave am, you time. I didn't lead with this. I gave you time to talk about 2024. You got right, that time. Dude. And this is now your, your chance to address this. And you're not addressing Ari, it. That's fine. Ari, you're, That's, you're not people addressing can read that the for fact. themselves. You're not addressing You want me to respond to you? Now we're at the end of the interview. On his you want me to respond to that? Okay. I'd be, I'd do, be happy do you to since we're on live air. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to respond to you on live air. Go I ahead. quoted a New York Times article that said at the convention, Donald Trump was his own biggest prop. It was a New York Times quote about how he let, let me read had become you. how he had become such an important figure in rebounding well, from what was a horrific assassination attempt. Fox let, let News, which I'm, uh, Corey, I said I'd address it. I'm going to finish. Fox News. Uh, many viewers may not know about this, but but apparently you do, and and some do. Fox News, which has been caught in defamation, ran a false piece, falsely stating that I said something else that I didn't say. So I stand on that. I stand on the New York so Times. So you quote. didn't say. This bandage was a proper spectacle from a candidate who's obsessed that. with spectacles. Uh, Mr. Lewandowski, I did Ari, not say Ari, that. That is a false quote. I have it right quote, here. It's, it's clear. You, what you it's have like is you a false absolutely quote. Said what it. you have is a false quote. And if you, I'm putting you on notice, if you continue to repeat falsely that I said that, you will be potentially in a defamation situation because I didn't say that. But I understand that you're working off the internet, which is a lot of false well, information. This, this is what it says I wish right you luck here. with that. And Corey Lewandowski, we gave you time. So you I appreciate you coming to the on. For that. Thank you for joining me. Corey Lewandowski, you Trump bet. 2024. We heard from Trump 2024 official Corey Lewandowski. Now we hear from an Obama campaign veteran, Jake Coleman Dury. Uh, your thoughts on uh, Mr. Lewandowski and the interview? Well, you know, we heard the phrase alternative facts. This was an alternative world. This is an alternative world where Donald Trump is some anti-vax warrior rather than someone who said the vaccine should be named after him. He called it the Trump scene, said it was one of the greatest miracles of the ages. Uh, this is a world where Donald Trump never came out in favor of a national ban on abortion, which he did in February of this year, where he endorsed uh, Lindsey Graham's 15-week ban, where he has repeatedly said that women should be jailed, that there should be punitive punishments meted out 
by states for this. Uh, this is a world where the American people wanted Roe versus Wade to be overturned when they clearly did not. This is a world where Project 2025 was just a random document put out by some who knows what, rather than a book with, with a forward by J.D. Vance, his vice presidential candidate, with full wording lifted from Project 2025 into the GOP platform and then into Donald Trump's own speeches. So this is an entirely alternative world that Corey Lewandowski has laid out, and it should be of no surprise to us. I mean, Lewandowski says you can't believe a thing he says. He refuses to say whether he's telling you the truth or a falsehood, and he just wants everyone else to sort of think, hey, you know, everybody else does it. Everybody else lies, even though that wasn't the case. That wasn't the case, but you will play that whataboutism repeatedly, and that's basically going to be the game that we're going to be seeing here yeah. for the next 10 weeks. Yeah, there was so much to choose from, and we wanted to get him on record. He hasn't been on in years. The abortion lies seemed really striking. I mean, if you boil down what he said, it was, pay no attention to the platform, Donald Trump's history, as you mentioned, 25. And by the way, hey, go ahead, vote us yeah. down. Vote against the Trump position on abortion around the country. Uh, when's the last time you can think of someone running on something while telling everyone, hey, it's fine, just, just vote me down in the states? No, that was never the Trump position. That is not the Trump position, the position of the Republican Party. And that is not the position of the American people who want the constitutional right to reproductive rights restored by them, by their government. That is their position. What has happened here is Donald Trump knows he has a very unpopular position. Right. He keeps changing it back and forth to adjust to the polls so he can get, get himself elected again.